Namaste and greetings. I am Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nevili. Welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a talk under the series, The State of Economy, hashtag Econ Dialogue, with Professor S. Ramakrishna Velamuri on Three Narratives on China's Economic Miracle. This deliberation is being organized by the IMPRI, Center for the Study of Finance and Economics. I feel honored to introduce the moderator, Professor Nilanjan Panik. Sir currently works as a professor at Mahindra University, India. He is also an academic consultant with Geneva Network, United Kingdom, Hankook University of Foreign Studies, South Korea, and until recently, a senior consultant with Tata Trust, India. Professor Barnick's works focus on the application of time series econometrics in issues relating in international trade, market structure, and development economics. Professor Barnick has project experience with Geneva Network, Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Laffer Associates, Ministry of Commerce, Government of India, IRS, IGRIAR, Center for Economic Policy Research, ADB, UNSCAP, and World Trade Organization. He has published in academic journal of repute and contributes regularly in national and international media. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I feel privileged to introduce the speaker, Professor S. Ramakrishna. Sir is Professor and Dean of the School of Management, Mahindra University. He was previously Cheng Wei Capital Professor of Entrepreneurship at the China Europe International Business School, on whose faculty he served for nearly 14 years. At CEIBS, he taught courses on entrepreneurship, innovation, and strategic negotiations to thousands of Chinese entrepreneurs and executives from state owned enterprises, Chinese private companies, and multinationals operating in China. He has been a facilitator in executive education programs for senior managers of Michelin, Tencent, China Development Bank, Air Liquide, Roche, Shandong Gold, Kang Shifu, Bosch, UNICEF, Abort Laboratories, among others. He has also been a facilitator in the China Entrepreneurial Leadership Camp for High Growth Chinese Entrepreneurs and the CEO Collaborative Forum for High Growth European entrepreneurs. He has written for, given interviews to, and been quoted in a number of international and national media outlets. His research has been published in leading academic and practitioner journals, including 50 teaching case studies, most of which are available through Harvard Business School Publishing, IWA Publishing, and CEI Best Publishing. Three of his case studies have won awards, and several have been on the bestseller lists. Welcome, sir. We are fortunate to have Professor Amita Batra and Dr. Priyanka Pandit as the discussants for the session. Professor Batra is the chairperson and professor, Center for South Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Welcome, ma'am. Dr. Pandit is a postdoctoral fellow, Department of International Relations and Government Studies, Shivnadar University. Welcome, ma'am. Now, I invite Professor Barnick to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thanks, Mahima. Uh, so, um, let me first thank uh, Impri to organize such an event, topical event. So this talk is about China. As we all know, India and China are the two largest growing economies in the world. Let me give you an idea how big are this economy. Accounting for the difference in cost of living across countries, that is in purchasing power term, the size of the Chinese economy is now $25 trillion, which makes the Chinese economy the largest economy in the world. Whereas that of the Indian economy is $9 trillion US dollar. Just to put into perspective, the US economy is around $20 trillion US dollar. Now, the rapid growth of these two uh, Asian giants 
have had impact on the world economy and therefore the importance of today's talk. Now, China is integrated with the world economy in much better fashion in comparison to the Indian economy. When I say integrated, in terms of trade as a percentage of GDP, you will find that the Chinese economy is doing much better compared to India. And many people, many scholars suggest that may be one of the reason as why China has aged out of India in terms of both in terms of per capita income and also in terms of growth rate. As you may know that in terms of per capita income, Chinese economy has already uh, crossed $10,500 per capita per annum. Whereas that of Indian economy is still, uh, it's around 2000 uh, US dollar per capita per annum, which is basically suggesting that our per capita income is one fifth that of China. Now, why is it that the Chinese economy has grown so fast? Uh, in particular, and this is uh, an interesting statistics, if you were to look into the per capita income of India vis-a-vis -vis China way back in early 1990, uh, you will find India's per capita income was in fact higher than that of China. In the year 1990, uh, India's per capita income was 368 US dollar per capita per annum, whereas that of Chinese economy was only 318 uh, uh, dollar per capita per annum. You know? So basically, uh, since 1990, you see that big transformation which has happened for China. And uh, for those of you uh, who are not from economics background, uh, you should also know that World Bank classifies economies into low income economy, middle income economy, and high income economy. Now, one very important thing which is going to happen a few years from now is China is going to uh, graduate from middle income economy to high income economy because World Bank definition of high income economy are the ones with per capita income more than 12,000 696 US dollar per capita per annum. And China is already very close to that mark. So what has led to this uh, dramatic rise of China? Uh, and, and some studies are in fact suggesting by the year 2049, I just mentioned in terms of purchasing power parity, but even if you consider in absolute term, uh, China is going to overtake in terms of per capita income, uh, what US have. Uh, please uh, take into note that at present, the US per capita income is around 60,000 US dollar. So uh, scholars and studies are suggesting by year 2049, or maybe much earlier than that, some studies are also suggesting by 2030, China is going to overtake US to become the largest economy in absolute term. Although they have already become uh, the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. So can Indian policymaker take a cue from China, uh, take some positive signal from China as what they have done in order to uh, become one of the largest economy in order to go, soon going to become one of the superpower, economic superpower. To know about all of this, let me invite Professor Ramakrishna Velamari. So what we are going to do is first let Professor Velamuri speak about this particular topic for 30 minutes. Thereafter, we are going to have uh, two distinguished scholars who are working on this particular topic. We are going, we are going to have uh, Dr. Priyanka Pandit from Shivnadar University and Professor Amita Batra from JNU who are going to be our discussant. And after that, I'm going to entertain uh, Q&A and then maybe uh, we are going to wrap the session, uh, taking the key findings from the talk. So without further delay, let me invite Professor Ramakrishna Velamari. Uh, Professor, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjan, for that very uh, nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Mahima, for your introduction of the session. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, for organizing this event and for inviting me to be a speaker. Uh, I'm also very grateful to professors Amita Bhatra and Dr. Priyanka Pandit for agreeing to be discussants here. Uh, and welcome everybody to the session. Um, my uh, association with China actually began in 2006, uh, not that long ago. 
when I made my first uh, visit to China. Until then, I had been a student of uh, what was going on in China without ever having visited China. And uh, in uh, late 2006, early 2007, uh, I got an opportunity to uh, work in China. Um, I was offered a full-time job on a three-year contract. And um, with my family, we moved to Shanghai in 2007. And we liked it so much that uh, we decided to, to continue there. So I'd moved from Spain, from Barcelona. And uh, so we continued in uh, China for nearly 14 years, as, uh, the, the, as um, Mahima just mentioned. And during this time, um, I had the privilege of working with in, at the best uh, business school in uh, China. And I had the opportunity of uh, teaching and interacting with and learning from uh, thousands of uh, Chinese students and executives. So I am a more of a micro person. Uh, I study entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so my perspective of an economy is basically I build up you know, my, 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 my vision of an economy from the ground up rather than analyzing macroeconomic data. But I, in today's presentation, I'll, I'll still be sharing with you some macroeconomic data that are very well known, actually, and that have been anticipated by Professor Nilan Janbani, who's a good friend and, uh, and, uh, and a great economist. So thanks to Nilan Jan for agreeing to, to moderate this session. So I will take about uh, 30 minutes, as Nilanjit just mentioned, uh, to go over my, my presentation. And So uh, this is the presentation. Mm -hmm. Let me. Uh, can you all see it? I, I hope you can see. It. We can see. Oh, okay. So basically, you know what explains the growth differential, okay? And this is the growth differential, as uh, as uh, Nilanjan pointed out. Um, until roughly 1980, um, on a on a GDP, uh, if you measure the size of the economy based on the GDP. Uh, in US dollars at current exchange rates. Um, the two countries were roughly the same size. Uh, there is a little bit of a controversy about this because as you know, um, Angus Madison has um, uh, recalculated the growth rates in China. And it looks like based on his data that the size of the Chinese economy around 1980 was somewhat understated because the, they, they did not do a very good job of measuring the services sector. But be that as it may, if you look at the official figures of the, of the um, two economies, um, we see that they were not that different in 1980, but then the trajectories of the two economies have been remarkably different over the next uh, roughly four decades. And if you look at the... Um, um, GDP per capita uh, on a purchasing power parity basis, uh, China is still about two and a half times the size of uh, India. So um, these are just some, some, uh, some more data about the economy. I think these are well known. Uh, China has um, succeeded in uh, migrating a very large percentage of its agriculture labor uh, out of agriculture and into industry and services. Um, India is uh, somewhat unique as a developing nation uh, in that it has a relatively small uh, industry uh, and a relatively large services sector. Um, we still have a significant number of our labor force in agriculture. So I'm going to share with you three narratives today. Uh, the first narrative is what I call the economics 101 um, narrative, which is actually quite well known. And I'll spend the least amount of time on this narrative. Um, the second narrative is the human capital narrative, which is less well known. It is well known amongst uh, you know, 
students of economics and maybe students of China studies, but it's not broadly known. And uh, so I'll spend a little more time on the human capital narrative. And I'll spend the most amount of time on the science and technology narrative, which is perhaps um, also a known, but I don't think the connections between the science and technology policy of China and its economic growth have been made strongly enough. So I'll, I'll, I'll spend the most time on narrative three. So if you look at narrative one, uh, basically we are saying that uh, China created an attractive env environment for investors uh, and they were successful in uh, integrating their economy with both, uh, region, in, in, with both regional uh, and uh, global economies. And this combined with the abundant supply of cheap land and labor drove sustained economic growth over four decades. So this is the, uh, the, the narrative. And what exactly are we talking about here? You know, as I said, an investor-friendly environment, um, special economic zones, which made it very easy for uh, um, uh, companies to function, both international companies and uh, local companies. One very unique feature of, of um, countries with high levels of uh, Chinese ethnic populations is their high savings rate. So this has been observed with the Asian tigers. And this is true of um, uh, China also. So China's uh, savings rate is very high, which has allowed them to invest you know, more aggressively in the development of their economy. So they, their investment rate, what we refer to as uh, gross fixed capital formation, has been uh, eight to 10 percentage points higher than India uh, on average over the last per, per year. Uh, over the last uh, four decades. Uh, abundant supply of both land and labor uh, and very, very, I would say, uh, permissive labor laws, permissive for companies. Uh, the first serious labor protection law, the labor contract law was introduced and took effect only on the 1st of January, 2008. And of course, you know, a very, very important event was China's accession to the World Trade Organization. So as I said, these factors are very, very well known and I won't dwell too much on them. Uh, this is just uh, to, to, um, to share with you what I mentioned earlier about the investment rates. You can see that you know, the upper uh, uh, curve is China and the lower curve is India. Uh, India's uh, uh, investment to GDP ratio peaked at about 35% uh, soon after the, the financial crisis. Uh, but in fact, one of the worrying aspects of uh, the Chinese, the Indian economy is that um, uh, our investment to GDP ratio has been falling over the last six to seven years. Uh, but China, especially after 2008, uh, has continued to invest very heavily, particularly in infrastructure. Um, we can debate later, you know, um, how good uh, this is, you know, from a from an economics perspective, because uh, um, economists are um, interested in the efficiency of capital utilization. And uh, we can talk about whether um, China is continuing to get a good return on its uh, investment in terms of uh, GDP growth. Um, and of course, you know, the export story is quite spectacular. Uh, China's exports currently are, uh, are at about 2.7 trillion. Um, India's this year, uh, I think, are going to be much better. I think we've already crossed uh, 400 billion, sorry, uh, we've crossed 300 billion in nine months uh, of merchandise exports. And um, uh, I think the, the uh, Commerce Ministry is uh, um, optimistic that we'll end um, uh, the 2022 uh, financial year, 2021-2022 financial year, um, with merchandise exports uh, higher than 400 billion. Um, so, so exports in India are picking up, but still uh, very, very uh, far from where China is today. And this is just the, the manufacturing map of China. Uh, one of the um, uh, remarkable things, if you look at the China-India difference, is that how successful China has been 
in its um, in building up its manufacturing sector, uh, which um, uh, was approximately uh, four trillion um, U.S. dollars. The manufacturing output was four trillion U.S. dollars in 2018, uh, and India was, uh, you know, almost one tenth of that. Uh, and uh, I believe it is somewhere uh, the, it's the sixth largest in the world. You know, even smaller than South Korea. Being a single party system, uh, China has been more successful in um, rolling out its infrastructure, especially, you know, roads and, and, uh, and uh, uh, industrial uh, development areas. Um, because land acquisition in China has not been as big an issue as in India, which is a democracy. Um, uh, and generally speaking, I would say, China has not allowed politics to trump economics until 2020. And uh, we can talk about what changed in 2020 uh, with, the, uh, with the cancellation of the Ant Financial IPO, I, I think, uh, and the challenges faced by Alibaba founder Jack Ma. Uh, so it looks like starting 2020, um, politics is, is becoming as important as economics even in China. But at least until 2020, uh, I would say that China did not allow politics to trump uh, economics and in any democracy, not just in India, um, politics usually trumps economics, um, and that's why um, some of these the, the, the speed of progress in some of these areas is not as as quick as um, in 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 a in a system like uh, China's. So this is the uh, uh, kind of narrative one, okay? And I think uh, there are no surprises here. Um, but let's go to narrative two, which is the uh, human capital narrative. So here, um, you know, it, the story goes something like this, that although China and India were both poor in 1980, China actually possessed better human capital with respect to India. And this explains the differences in economic trajectories. Um, so let's just look at some data points. Um, uh, the literacy, uh, in 1981-82, in China was about 25 percentage points higher than in India. Uh, this difference uh, was, in fact, amplified 10 years later. And the differences today are still quite significant, more than 20 percentage points, right? The latest figures, I think, for India are 78%. Uh, and China has um, achieved almost universal literacy. In our 14 years in China, we only came across one person uh, who could not read and write. And as you know, the standard for being considered literate in China is actually very high. Um, uh, individuals who can read 1500 characters um, are those who are considered literate, whereas the standard actually is much lower in India. I believe uh, the ability to read the headline of a newspaper uh, or to sign your name is what qualifies a person as literate. I don't know if that has changed recently, but that was the standard sometime back. So as far as human capital is concerned, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping uh, in 1980 had much, bit, much better or much, much better qualified human capital to work with in terms of uh, literacy. He also, he also had better human capital in terms of health. So China was a more healthy population in 1980. And uh, the differences have narrowed somewhat. I think India has made some, some good progress um, in the last 40 years. But the differences with respect to China are still quite significant, okay? Uh, whether it's life expectancy, uh, whether it's um, under five mortality rate. Um, and if you look at uh, hospital uh, beds, you know, the healthcare infrastructure, uh, China is still far ahead of India. The third uh, dimension of um, human capital, I would, I would call it the gender equality. And here, China has been a more equal population. I think 
you're all very familiar, especially those of you who are um, uh, China scholars, that uh, Mao's famous statement that women hold up half the world, you know, uh, he was able to actually uh, achieve quite a lot during his time. And um, the World Economic Forum produces a report called the Gender Gap Report. So they look at where women stand in a society with respect to men. So they are, they are not looking at absolute outcomes for women, but they're looking at outcomes for women with respect to outcomes for men, okay? And they're looking at four dimensions. One is economic participation and opportunity. And here, uh, China is ranked 69th in the world. India is ranked um, 151st. One of the poorest, actually, uh, one of the lowest ranked out of 156, India is ranked 151st. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, nearly 69% of the uh, female population in China that is in the working age is working. Whereas that number in India is only 22.3%. Uh, and my understanding is that in the last few years, we've actu actually gone backwards on this, on this metric. Uh, the labor force participation for males for in China is 82.8. Uh, and in India, actually, it's quite close to that of China for males, it is 79.6. And the ratio of female to male participation is 0 0.83 in the case of China and 0 0.28 in the case of India. So this is a, a very, very big difference. And you know, for anybody who has visited China or lived in China, you can see uh, you know, women everywhere in the workplace. Uh, that's one of the things that strikes you, especially when you go from India, the very strong presence of women in the workforce. And when it comes to gender equality, China actually has better outcomes than many of the richer East Asian countries, such as Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, Taiwan, and other economies in Southeast Asia. Uh, in educational attainment, uh, China is also ranked higher than India. When it comes to health and survival, both countries are at the absolute bottom of the heap. Uh, and uh, this is uh, largely due to the fact that uh, both countries uh, have practiced abortion of female fetuses, which with severely skewed uh, male to female uh, populations. And in fact, uh, the Chinese uh, population is actually more skewed than the Indian population. And finally, of course, the one dimension on which India does better than China is in political empowerment because we are a democracy and women are empowered both as voters and you know, in their freedom to stand for political office. So we've seen three, three dimensions until now of human capital. One is uh, literacy rates. The second is um, healthcare. The third is gender equality. And we've concluded that China has been over the past 40 years, a more literate population, a healthier, pop healthier population, and a more equal population. And finally, when it comes to social mobility, um, this is uh, uh, an index uh, that has been prepared by uh, Visual Capitalist, I believe. Mm -hmm. And here you see China ranked 45th in the world, 45th out of 80, 82 countries and India actually quite low, uh, ranked 76th, okay? And we all know, you know, what, what, what this means, you know, this is, uh, sociologists call this uh, um, social stratification, right? Uh, how freely can individuals move up and down the socioeconomic ladder? And this has to do with um, economic opportunity, this has to do with educational opportunities, it has to do with healthcare opportunities. It has to do with you know, um, the absence of discrimination. Um, so these are dimensions on which China does consistently better. Um, it is not possible in China to tell um, the social economic status of a person just by their surname. Okay, there are a very limited number of surnames in China relative to other countries. 
And so the, the surname does not signal the socioeconomic status of a, of a person. And there is a, a general dignity to labor that we have observed there that is, is not seen in, in many other countries, including India. So this is the human capital story. And, and one of the things that I would like us to think about is that many of these wins, if you call it, if you can call them that, uh, on human capital were already in place before the, um, uh, the reform and opening up process, okay, which started after Mao's death. Um, and the architect of the reform and opening process uh, is, uh, I think, rightly attributed to uh, Deng Xiaoping. So, um, you know, the one question that perhaps we should ask uh, is, uh, would Deng Xiaoping have been as successful in his economic policies if he had not had a Mao preceding him, right? Um, again, that, that's, that's an open question that we can debate uh, during the Q&A time. So narrative number three is science and technology policy. And here uh, the story goes that China did a much better job than India in leveraging science and technology to drive, to drive growth. Um, coincidentally, you know, um, well, Deng Xiaoping's uh, economic reforms were called the four modernizations, agriculture, industry, defense, and then science and technology. Um, and we can, we can make the argument that uh, China's science and technology policies have played you know, an equally important role as the other two factors that we spoke about, the economic policies and their human capital gains uh, with respect to India. So um, the, the, the 40 years, you know, the, from the 80s, 80s to the 2020s um, have coincided globally uh, with uh, the PC revolution, the personal computer revolution, uh, and it's uh, later avatars, you know, the, the tablet, uh, the laptop and the tablet, with, then with the uh, uh, mobile phone revolution, and then the smartphone revolution, okay? Um, and the successive you know, 3G, 4G, and now 5G, um, uh, bandwidth, you know, becoming, uh, you know, widely available, uh, and data, data uh, pricing becoming lower and lower and lower, right? Um, and of course, you know, the Chinese have also played an important role in making, uh, handsets, um, earlier feature phone handsets, and now smartphone handsets, um, uh, you know, widely available and more affordable, you know, to the to the global population. So, the forty years of reform and opening up in China, the four decades of reform, reform and opening up, have actually coincided with some major technological breakthroughs uh, globally, and China has actually, you know. China has ridden this, this wave uh, perhaps more effectively than any other major economy. And the, uh, the, the, the uh, relative uh, youth of the population, although China is an older population than India's in terms of median age, but with respect to the West, uh, it, it is still younger, it, it especially it was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and the fact that it was, it didn't have any legacy uh, practices such as, you know, widespread use of checks, which is even today very common in the United States, uh, has meant that uh, the population has adopted these technologies um, much more smoothly than perhaps in other countries. Today, uh, China is the global leader in consumer technologies and consumer tech whereas the US continues to be um, the global leader in enterprise tech. And uh, India actually plays a very important role in the, in the United States' leadership in enterprise technologies. Uh, that's another, again a story that has not been told uh, widely enough, and we can debate that uh, if you're interested. 
Um, so famous statement, Deng Xiaoping, science and technology are the primary productive forces, right? Um, so in some ways we can say that um, China has leveraged technology to leapfrog many, many other countries of the world. Um, you can see this in the uh, high-speed rail network. Once again, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm trained in business studies. And so uh, I always look at the efficiency of investments. Um, I used to regularly travel from uh, uh, Shanghai to Beijing, especially by high-speed train. Uh, I stopped traveling by air about six, seven years ago. Um, and a distance of appro approximately 1,300 kilometers was covered in four hours. Um, so uh, at that corridor, the Beijing-Shanghai corridor is very, very busy. But uh, China has uh, invested in, in high-speed rail in parts of the country where the demand is simply not there. Um, in the hope that the infrastructure investment would generate demand in the future. And the result of that is that today, uh, the, uh, the debt that the railway organizations carry uh, in, in, in China is about 850 billion US dollars, okay? Um, and how sustainable that is, is again, uh, open for debate. If you look at uh, you know the, the, the mobile uh, bandwidth, right? Um, if you look at the top ten countries with the most installed um, uh, mobile bandwidth, in 1986, China was not even in the picture, right? The United States was the largest country with 27% of the installed bandwidth. Whereas in 2014, already uh, China had 29% of the bandwidth installed globally. And I was talking in. Uh, early 2019 with um, the chief marketing officer of Huawei. Uh, and he was telling me that when he travels abroad, when he travels to Europe and the United States, he's frustrated because the internet speeds are so much uh, lower uh, in, in European countries than in the US, right? China has the largest internet population in absolute numbers. And most of these, 98% of these uh, users uh, access the internet through their, through their mobile phones. And they transact on the, um, on, um, on, the, on the mobile phones also. Starting from 2016, so I was, um, I left uh, China in um, early 2020. Uh, to come to India for a, for a, I brought a, a group of Chinese entrepreneurs to India on, a, on an India immersion. And my plan was to go back after Chinese New Year in 2020. But that didn't happen for, for reasons that I think you all know. And uh, I was, um, I was, you know, the, the Indian government closed the airspace in India, the Chinese government did the same, and then it became impossible to go back. And finally, I decided um, in early 2021 to take up um, a new uh, job here in India. But uh, I would say between 2016 and 2019, um, I hardly used any currency uh, in China. So all my, and neither did I use uh, the debit card, which is the union pay card, which had been the main uh, you know, mechanism for uh, making uh, payments in restaurants and departmental stores and so on, um, and supermarkets, uh, I stopped using both currency and debit cards. And I was only using WeChat Pay, which was ex uh, accepted everywhere, even by uh, you know, the street vendors. They had QR code that you could scan and, and you could pay, which is, of course, now uh, also available in India. So China was, I think, the first major economy to achieve a very, very high level of cashlessness in its economy. Uh, in terms of number of transactions, I think in terms of number of digital transactions, um, India now exceeds China. So India has done a fantastic job in, in, with the UPI uh, platform, um, but in value, I think China is still far ahead. 
Uh, this is one area of you know, uh, e-commerce uh, where uh, we are lagging far behind. This is another case, I think, where um, politics has trumped economics in India. Uh, our 2021 uh, uh, e-commerce retail value was about $67 billion compared to nearly $2.8 trillion in China. And of course, I'm going to skim through these slides very quickly. China is one of the biggest investors in um, artificial intelligence. Uh, as of 2017, they were funding 48% uh, uh, of uh, new ventures that were um, leveraging artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, as of 2018, uh, companies working in the area of artificial intelligence in China were generating 20 billion uh, UN in um, uh, revenues, which is currently probably much higher than that. So China is, has moved from the manufacturing economy to a service economy to a moving towards a knowledge economy. Um, the, there is a very steep rise in AI patent applications in China. So while the US continues to lead in uh, patent applications, the rate of growth in China is much, much higher. Um, if you look at AI companies, uh, China lags significantly behind the US, uh, but it's the second uh, most important country in the world. In, in terms of machine learning patents, again, China is world number two. But when it comes to uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence, uh, the patent publications uh, from, from China are uh, the highest. Funding for AI, China's investment in AI is big, but still well behind the US. These were the companies, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, also called BAT in China, uh, that were very, very active both in acquisitions, as well as in taking minority stakes uh, in startups outside China also, both in China and outside China. So if you look at the um, investments of these three giants, 46% uh, of their investments are in China, but as much as 44% are in uh, the United States. And many uh, Chinese companies that I know personally startups that I know personally have uh, offices in Israel or have stakes in Israeli startups. Because Israel is one of the leaders in artificial intelligence. I have been following the Global Innovation Index for many years now. And China's uh, progress on this is quite remarkable. Um, uh, China is the highest ranked upper middle income country. If you look at uh, the column which says income, you'll see in the top 25, every, every other country is HI, high income. But China is the only one ranked 14th, which is upper middle income. Okay. Um, the latest rankings in 2021 place China in the 12th rank. So China has progressed from 14 to 12. And India in the 46th rank. Okay, and here, what is the secret of China's catch up? It is basically that post 2008, when most of the advanced economies either cut backs drastically on their R&D spend or grew it minimally, China expanded its R&D expenditures most aggressively. So if you take, uh, 2008 as the as the uh, comparison year as 100 then by 2016 china had almost tripled its r and d expenditures okay um, whereas countries such as uh, france for example had grown only from 100 to 150 and grown only 15% over 8 years right um, so China, had, this is the really the, the story of China's catch up in, in science and technology. Post 2008, China has thrown a, a huge number of 
uh, you know, a huge amount of resources behind its um, um, uh, innovation, you know, uh, initiatives. Now, so if you look at uh, the bottom of the slide, I provide some data, right? In 2021, uh, the estimated expenditure of, on R&D of China, both public and private, this is called the gross expenditure on research and development, GERD, was 323 billion dollars. Uh, India's was 18 billion dollars, okay? So the question that we should ask ourselves is, uh, of course, you know, India is behind China uh, because for every dollar that India spends, China is spending 18, one eight, okay? But I think it's remarkable that India has done as well as it has uh, with R&D expenditures that are as low as they are. Okay, so China's success is not surprising given the resources that they have dedicated to R&D. Uh, India, I would say, is punching much above its weight. Uh, if you look at the lower middle income countries, which is where India falls in the World Bank classification that uh, Professor Banik was talking about, um, India is ranked second in, in terms of its um, uh, innovativeness, uh, only behind Vietnam. Um, and I think, you know, there's something for us to think about. Uh, in general, I would say the uh, output to input ratio in India for resources is very, very high. Okay. So we are able to achieve a lot more with very, very limited investments. It's just that I wish that we, invest, we, we could invest a little more in, in science and technology. Uh, but in spite of investing so little, I think we need to acknowledge that India actually does very well. Um, so currently India's uh, R&D expenditures to GDP are at approximately 0.7%. Okay, uh, China's are currently at 2.2 percent, and um, an advanced economy like the United States, uh, I think there the ratio would be probably close to three percent, if I'm not mistaken. At least for the manufacturing industry in the U.S., it's about 2.8 percent. Patent applications, you know, if you look at uh, patents, patent applications filed domestically. Uh, the 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 picture is that China uh, files almost 100 times as many applications as India does. Uh, a lot of scholars, many scholars, and many of them Chinese scholars, have raised questions about the quality of these patent applications, um, and uh, we can have a discussion about that also. Okay, uh, in China, most of the patents are filed by a domestic residents. Um, only a tiny fraction are filed by non-residents, mean, meaning by and large multinational companies operating in China. Whereas in India, the picture is actually quite different. The vast majority of patents filed in India are actually by uh, multinational companies. In terms of, if you look at the triadic patent families, uh, these are uh, patents that are filed simultaneously in the United States, Japan, and EU patent offices. Um, the, the difference is not as stark as the domestic patents, where I said earlier that uh, the difference is 100 times um, when it comes to triadic patents, which are the really high quality patents. Uh, China uh, is about 10 times uh, India. One of the major breakthroughs when it comes to uh, uh, you know, Chinese manufacturing is their uh, cost innovation is called, right? So they have really offered unbeatable value for money to um, consumers all over the world when it comes to mobile handsets, smartphones. 
Um, and uh, even today, uh, for example, the, in, in India, the, the smartphones are so popular because the value for money proposition is, is quite uh, difficult to beat. China has a much larger uh, ecosystem of manufacturing companies. It's not just the number of manufacturing companies, but on average, uh, the Chinese manufacturing um, uh, unit is much bigger than uh, India's, right? So in India, you have um, companies that are manufacturing companies that are much smaller in size than uh, Chinese companies. Science and uh, engineering uh, articles. Uh, here you see, for example, this dark blue line that is rising very fast, right, is China. China has uh, overtaken the United States and is behind only the EU in terms of uh, uh, thousands of science and engineering articles published between 2003 and 2016. Um, if you look at output in the top uh, 1%, uh, but the output in terms of the top 1% of cited publications, there I think the United States and, and Europe have a significant lead over China. But China is improving very fast, as you can see, right? Uh, this uh, pinkish uh, curve, you can see how fast it's actually growing over time. India, surprisingly, actually, uh, given the very little resources that we dedicate to, to, to innovation, um, in my view, does not actually do badly. So, uh, you know, I leave, I leave uh, the audience with the question, which narrative is the most persuasive for you? Um, I think the, to summarize, the, the economics 101 narrative is probably the best known. Uh, everybody recognizes that China was very successful in its economic policies. Um, it had certain advantages, you know, culturally, ethnic Chinese um, tend to save a lot more. Um, and this has allowed them to invest more. Um, and um, investment and exports have been the main drivers of uh, Chinese growth over the past four decades. But um, somewhat less known is the fact that uh, even at the start of the process of the reform and opening up, China had a much better human capital to work with than India. And finally, uh, China made uh, uh, much better use of uh, the global technological pro progress, okay? At least in the first two to three decades of, um, of the technological um, revolutions that I spoke about, uh, China was more uh, a recipient, but it was a beneficiary rather than a contributor to these uh, technological breakthroughs. Uh, but increasingly, China is becoming a contributor also in the areas of especially AI and machine learning. So I'll, I'll conclude my talk here and uh, uh, happy to, I'm very looking forward to listening to Professor Bhatra and Dr. Pandit's um, uh, assessment and their, their thoughts because uh, they, they are also China scholars for many years. Uh, thank thank you. you, Professor Velamari. This has been fantastic discussion. Uh, and uh, there are a few very informative points that I am taking uh, with me. But before I come to the key findings uh, of your talk, let me first invite Dr. Priyanka Pandit uh, to discuss uh, your presentation and followed by which we are going to have Professor Amita Batra uh, speak about your presentation. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pandit. Uh, thank you, Professor Banik. Uh, and thank you, Professor Velamuri for that very interesting uh, presentation. And now, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Arjun in India for inviting me uh, to this discussion and also for organizing this discussion, which I think is very important at a time when we all are looking at a great divergence in the global economy. Uh, where we have countries like China and the United States recovering from the pandemic soon and growing back to their pre-COVID uh, growth levels, 
and whereas prospects in other countries, including ours, look much worse. Now, uh, Professor Velamuri uh, had provided us three very interesting narratives, uh, and they're, in, they're very significant, uh, uh, and they account for uh, the miracle, uh, the Chinese growth miracle. But then uh, for the sake of a discussion, I think it is important to also uh, have a critical reading, to take a critical reading of these narratives. Now, uh, uh, the first uh, at the uh, economic, uh, the economic narrative that he just pointed, uh, and, and of course the uh, details that he provided, the, 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 the details with which he substantiated the economic narrative. Uh, we also need to take into account when we look at these details, the, the positives uh, in Chinese economy, the Chinese economy has been facing headwinds for some time now. The Chinese leadership uh, has been talking about the new normal in Chinese economy, right from the uh, global financial crisis after the large stimulus package, uh, after, the, after, after the Chinese leadership and the large stimulus package. And we know the problems surrounding that large stimulus package. Uh, as a result of the stimulus package, we know the first and most important challenge that the Chinese economy is facing is the debt, which is both domestically owned and owed. Now, uh, the debt, uh, which is rising three times of its GDP and uh, growing, what has happened as a result, we have seen that there's been an increased stream of misallocated capitals. Uh, we have rising number of debt defaulters in China, especially among state-owned enterprises, uh, and which, which, is, uh, which gives a quite clear indication that the Chinese government is facing huge financial stress and which is quite clear from Xi Jinping's current financial policies. And the upshot of which is definitely been the impact on China's employment, the rising unemployment and rising inequality. Uh, and the second uh, challenge uh, is also the demographic challenge. The country uh, that derived uh, its uh, growth from the vast pool of affordable and semi-skilled workforce, that comparative advantage has been on the decline for a long time now especially given China's declining fertility and the rising number of elderlies in its population. Uh, we know that the number of retirees has outnumbered the uh, working age population in China and the problems uh, that the working age population poses for, for uh, China's uh, uh, upward movements in the global value chain, because it acts as an important source of rigidity and interferes with the quality of the functioning of Chinese workforce. And the other uh, important impediment that China's uh, demographic challenge of the rising number of elderly pose is that the uh, elderly in China, uh, given the lack of social safety nets, or the poor social safety nets uh, that these developing countries, which is again a common thing between China and India, the poor social safety nets that exist, and, and this has become much more apparent in the post-COVID period. That with these elderly having very meager or no retirement incomes, they depend on their child for one child, the one child policies that was there, which is again a very, which was a straight state driven thing for a very long time till it was reversed recently. Uh, that the one child faces a lot of financial support, uh, has to bear the burden, the financial burden. Now with the increasing uh, costs of living and the fledgling social safety nets, it then becomes very difficult uh, for the families to sort of uh, uh, spend more. And then the tendency is towards uh, saving up, saving more and consume less. And which is being affecting China's transition to do domestic consumer demand driven economic model. And concomitant with the demographic challenge, which uh, Professor Velamuri rightly pointed, alluded in his presentation, is uh, that of the end of migrant miracle in China. Now, uh, we know that China, uh, the Chinese, if you look at the Chinese economic reform from 1980s, the migrant workers uh, played a very important role, the migrant workers from, uh, from the rural areas, they, they have formed the backbone, uh, they formed the backbone of urbanization. But now, uh, after uh, the global financial crisis, after 2008, 2010, what uh, the trend has been towards, uh, we have witnessed a reverse trend in China the, the uh, flow of migrants is drying up. And as a result of which we have seen higher wages in China, wages going up, economic slowdown. And uh, China, and we have also seen China recently importing a uh, workforce from uh, its border countries like Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar. And if you look at the Chinese factories, uh, if, if we go to Chinese factories, we'll come across these Chinese workers, uh, uh, 
a significant number of Chinese workers, a significant number of workers in the in these factories, speaking Vietnamese, uh, uh, in, 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 along with the uh, Mandarin or Futungwa. Then the third is the absence of institutions. And this has become again a major problem under, under, under Xi Jinping's uh, government, which is uh, the lack of institutions, credible and independent ones. Not that uh, China had independent institutions uh, since 1980s, but of course, uh, the, there was significant scope of debate and discussion uh, within the party uh, leadership on economic issues. So one thing on which debate was allowed in China for a very long time, since 1980s, uh, was the economic issues, economic aspects. I think uh, with Xi's coming to power, recentralization move with the red shift in Chinese economy, uh, that the scope for debate and discussion has has uh, is gone. Uh, and, and we see more of stifling and a top-down approach. And, and any sort of institutional discussion and absence of any discussions within these institutions. But the discussion is very important. Debates are very important uh, when we look at productivity, growth, and innovation. So uh, yes, it is true that authoritarian governments uh, face lesser constraints as compared to that of democracies and get their work done, fulfill their targets. But what they cannot provide for, and this has become a this has become an issue in China, and that's what uh, that, that, that has also been one of the major debates in the United States, uh, that uh, whether China will at all be uh, able to uh, overcome United States in innovation or, or be able to establish its own model of uh, technological capability building and innovation, because what it cannot provide for is competition, incentives, and relatively independent financial system. Uh, which can ensure an effective allocation of capital, a problem that has been ailing China science and technology program for, for a very long time. And now uh, we have also seen recently a year emphasis on state-owned institutions, uh, party discipline, uh, especially seen in the uh, case of Alibaba, Jack Ma. And that provides the curious, that proves the curious condition that private enterprises and entrepreneurship find themselves uh, not in a very conducive uh, enough situation for undertaking innovation and its uh, relative activities. The regulators outside, within and outside China have become increasingly worried that big tech firms could abuse this advantages. So traditional banks, which have been losing market, shared to the digital giants in both money management and lending are probably cheering the regulators uh, to take these tougher turns. And therefore, we see the crackdown on, on these major private sectors. Uh, so I would like to uh, stop by saying that uh, Xi Jinping, through his top-down, highly personalized approach to policymaking, has reinforced an institutional culture of conformity and control which in turn stifle competition and increases the chances for misallocation of capital. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Pandit, for your very valuable suggestion. Uh, we are going to take a few of them um, when I try to wrap this up. But thanks much for bringing some of the headwinds uh, that you have mentioned. And that may be subject of uh, discussion during the question and answer session. Now, may I request Professor Batra to give her comments, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilanjan. And uh, thank you to IMPRI for having invited me today for um, an important subject, important subject of discussion, uh, as I would say, you know, and something that has got the attention of the world, you know, for the past couple of years more because of the kind of political buildup that's been around uh, Chinese growth process, I would say, you know, while Chinese growth process, I think we've all um, been familiar with, you know, for the last two decades, uh, when it has been the fastest growing economy, and we've also had this natural um, urge to make comparisons between India and China, you know, as the fastest growing, second fastest growing economies, you know. Uh, the difference, of course, as, be, as has been uh, brought out by Professor Velamuri, you know, in terms of absolute is huge, something that we should be conscious of, you know, and something that needs reminding all the time 
in terms of the catch up that needs to be done by the Indian economy, you know. Uh, all accepted, and I think a very um, well presented detailed slides, you know, particularly I think the last section, you know, which is the AI technology, and which I would say is the core of the debate that's happening around the world, you know. So I think um, rightly focused, you know, in that sense, as far as the last detailed uh, approach is concerned. I'll make only a couple of points, and again, uh, you know, critical points here, which I'd like to point out so that uh, just to add to what has been presented, you know. Uh, the first point that I would want to make is, you know, the, I wish, uh, Professor Velamuri, you know, since you have so much detail here, you know, in your presentation, and I think the underlying paper too would have that, you know, it would help to build upon the linkages between these narratives, you know, rather than present them as mutually exclusive, you know. I mean, starting with your last slide, you know, when you say which is the most persuasive, you know, I don't want to see them as one against the other, but I want to see each contributing to the other, you know. And just to give you an example, you know, when you talk about technology, you know, uh, here we know that that's been the biggest uh, debatable point, you know, that we are looking at in these last couple of years. But this is also the point, you know, that I think is, um, you know, it's majorly contributing to what I think Priyanka uh, alluded to, you know, in terms of China's inward looking change, you know, that's happening in terms of its growth strategy, all out outward looking export oriented and so on, you know, and now there has been in the last, uh, you know, both as far as their plan is concerned, as well as the strategy is concerned, innovation based growth, you know, and innovation more to replace what was the dependence on the world, you know, trying to make, you know, uh, create more as far as domestically produced is concerned. So that bit, you know, how does that link up A with the kind of debate that's on, you know, in terms of US coming down on China in terms of technological innovation? Uh, how does China try and create its own independence, you know, in terms of innovating towards less outward orientation, more inward focus, you know? Uh, all of that, I think, needs to be built in, you know? And second, when you say, you know, that technology was not so much a part of the discussion earlier on, you know, and not much is known about technological advancement, uh, here are both a point and a question that I'd like to put forward, you know, is that, you know, the kind of... Um, a growth strategy or the kind of uh, export strategy that was trade strategy, which you allude, which you kind of, you know, bring out as the most persuasive economic 101 uh, narrative, you know, uh, had at its core the foreign direct investment policies of China, which, you know, again, uh, I don't want to say it's debatable, but it's known, you know, that technology transfer, forced technology transfer and policies oriented towards forced technology transfer were a major part of uh, China's you know, growth or upward movement as far as technological advancement is concerned. You know. What would you have to say about that? I think that's an important aspect where you link the third, the first, and ultimately what's happening and where China is going today, you know, in terms of both its rate, uh, both it, uh, its rate of growth, as well as as far as its policies are concerned, you know, how Xi Jinping is changing policies towards more inward orientation rather than outward, you know, and how, you know, that would build up in future. My second point, you know, that I would make also in this uh, light, you know, is with respect to the first where you talk about savings and investment, you know, I think you uh, kind of highlighted that and the difference as far as India is concerned uh, about how high the investments were as far as uh, China is concerned. Again, a point that Priyanka alluded to, but I think I'd like to connect it with a more uh, focused, uh, you know, point that I wish you would bring out is uh, financial markets, lack of, lack of development as far as financial markets in China are concerned, you know. That being the reason where, you know, what Priyanka said in terms of misallocation of capital or lack of efficient allocation of resources that's not available. And again, the other point here, you know, where you kind of say high investments because of high savings, but those high savings are because of a certain policy, you know, where you force people, you know, the household savings is the biggest component as far as China is concerned in its total savings. Why? Because of the, you know, social safety net policy, which they don't have as far as government provision is concerned, forcing people to save and, uh, you know, 
their own, you know, if we kind of focus also on their capital markets, you know, and how these have developed over time, I think another uh, dimension, you know, that would come forward and would be helpful in explaining uh, not just the differences, you know, but also highlight how India's reform process, you see, has been different and maybe also accounts to some extent, you know, that entire political building, you know, that happens as far as China is concerned in terms of its policies and hence the growth and hence everything else, you know. And the third and the last point that I would want to make, you know, is in terms of human capital, you know. Uh, when we talk about how China has been uh, far ahead, you know, as far as uh, human capital development is concerned, uh, this is a point where, you know, again, I'd like your inputs more than my pointing out a critical, uh, you know, critiquing your analysis is the emphasis on uh, primary education with tertiary education as far as India is concerned, you know, I mean, it's not like we haven't invested in uh, uh, human capital, you know, but in India, the, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is something that I think needs to be brought out, you know, that as far as India is concerned, our emphasis right from the beginning, uh, you know, from 1947, 50s, 60s, you know, when we built our best institutions, the IITs, the IIMs, and so on, you know, it's really been the uh, tertiary education that got the most focus and may have actually distorted the, you know, education or human capital development process, you know, not starting from the primary, which has been, I think, characteristic of many East Asian, Southeast Asian economies, because of which they are far ahead, you know, in terms of their read write. Uh, ability, you know, in comparison with what we see as far as the outcomes of our education process are concerned, you know. So I think these kinds of, uh, you know, um, dimensions, if you could bring out, you know, in terms of both the comparative picture, as well as, um, you know, making it slightly more critical as far as China is concerned, rather than all positives, you know, and placing it in the context of what's happening now, uh, you know, bringing it more to the current in terms of a uh, slight slowing down, projection slowing down, you know, as well as, uh, you know, the export import differences in terms of innovation building, you know, that's, uh, that's the important thing. I think uh, uh, that's about it. Otherwise, I would like to congratulate you on a very, very detailed and uh, informative, comprehensive uh, presentation that you've made, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amita. In fact, before I pass it on to Professor Velamuri, uh, let me also try to take a cue from what Professor Batra just now said. Uh, first of all, there is linkages between the three narratives that you have spoken about, which is in economics, uh, there are plenty of papers to suggest that there is some relationship between growth and development. Now, when you say that both in terms of growth and development, China has aged out of India. Uh, for instance, uh, as you may know, that one of the reasons why India is ranking below in the human development indicators has to do with lack of women empowerment and lack of uh, to take into control our use of natural water. You know? Now, when you say that the China has done miraculously well in terms of women empowerment, I think uh, one way to suggest is, and also human capital, one way to suggest is that the reason why they are growing may be because of their better development indicators. That is number one point. Number two, uh, which is again kind of interesting, uh, is what just now both uh, Amita and Priyanka mentioned, is if I look into the Indian stock market as well as the Chinese stock market, Indian stock market is going through the roof. You know, it has uh, between 2008 and 2022, as we speak, you see the remarkable increase in stock market indices, which has not happened in case of China. You know, now when uh, Professor Batra has mentioned that in spite of high saving rates, why is it that uh, the Chinese are not able to invest in the stock market? Is it because of lack of capital market uh, reforms that uh, Professor Batra maybe was mentioning? Or is it because of a few other things? Now, the third and the last thing before I pass it on to you, is there are some, uh, in India, there are some efficient institutions and there are not so efficient institutions. For instance, within court system, we have seen Supreme Court is a very efficient uh, in terms of handling the court cases, not so much in terms of high courts or district courts. You know? So what is the role 
uh, that the institutions and the government are playing for making China uh, the that that four trillion uh, value of manufacturing output that you just now mentioned. Uh, what is the role that their institution and government has played? And more importantly, um, I, I find this very interesting when uh, uh, Priyanka mentioned about the input output ratio. You know, it might so happen that in China, there are already many bridges, many hospitals being built. And therefore, the marginal return to build one more additional bridge or hospital may be less. So how do you kind of distinguish what element of efficiency? Is it because already we have enough of bridge roads uh, in place because of which you see the marginal return is low? Or is it because uh, they are not that efficient in terms of using their resources? So this kind of distinction will be, I think, uh, make uh, the discussion much more enriching. So over to you, Professor Velamuri. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to Priyanka, Amita, and uh, Nilanjan for your uh, very thoughtful and incisive comments. Of course, you know, uh, I, I, I know that the narratives are deeply intertwined and uh, they are mutually re reinforcing. Uh, so it's just a, a, a provocative play on my part to say that, uh, you know, the second and third are perhaps not as well known as the first one. And uh, it's one, one of the things that uh, Professor Amartya Sen and other development economists have been saying, you know, about India. And um, I recently saw an interview by the uh, finance minister of the Tamil Nadu government, uh, Mr. Palnivel Tyagarajan. Uh, who was, you know, even if you look at uh, the, the uh, differences within India, if you look at states like Tamil Nadu, which have achieved far greater, uh, you know, uh, progress in human uh, development, uh, you see that that has definitely an impact on economic growth, right? Uh, so so th th definitely those, are, those, those, those points are well taken. Uh, let me just comment briefly, uh, uh, Yes, Priyanka, there are significant headwinds. Okay, significant headwinds. Even before uh, Xi Jinping uh, came uh, to power, um, you may have uh, heard a statement by Premier Wen Jiabao, you know, um, who after injecting 700 billion into the uh, of stimulus into the economy uh, post 2008, he said that the Chinese economy is highly unbalanced, right? Highly unbalanced, and that's that's a danger. So uh, uh, this now, these headwinds that existed even before Xi Jinping came to power um, are now, you know, combined with a policy which seemingly reverses the, the, the economic policies of Deng Xiaoping and his successes, right? And uh, to me, you know, last year when I when I was looking at what was happening in China, it did not make any sense, right? Because why would a country that has achieved an economic miracle? This, this is what this is the term I think that Larry Summers used. That no no major economy has grown uh, at such high rates over such a prolonged period of time. Why would a country reverse uh, the policies that have given it such remarkable? economic success and as a result of the economic success huge political clout all over the world right uh, taking it to a superpower status um, and the only cogent explanation that i have i have uh, read until now is that offered by uh, mr ns leons i think everybody who is um, who is a china scholar has read this essay uh, but those who haven't, you know, for those who haven't, I've just put it up on the uh, on the chat box, the link to the article. And I think um, this is a this is a very very interesting article. It 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 provides uh, an explanation for what is happening. You know, the reasons why we are seeing what we are seeing in China. And if it's true, then it's a very very bold and extraordinarily risky move on the part of the leadership of China today uh, to, in some ways. De-Westernize, excuse me, in, in, in some ways de-Westernize um, uh, China as a country and take it back to its uh, to its roots. 
uh, the timing, I think, of 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 these 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 some of these measures, such as the crackdown on the tech sector, the crackdown on the on the uh, private tutorial market, um, and the tightening of regulations in real estate, uh, you know, we can question the timing because they they are coming at a time when many of these other pressures are coming to the fore. You know, Priyanka spoke about the debt issue, right? Uh, and to what extent are the, are the stricter regulations that real estate companies have to, have to adhere to, to what extent are they exacerbating the, the, the challenges that the real estate sector is facing today? So uh, currently, uh, and there is in the last few weeks, we have seen at least uh, uh, some attempt to reverse some of these harsh uh, crackdowns on the different sectors that the Chinese government has been imposing since uh, last year, right? Since uh, the, the, the the withdrawal of the Ant Financial IPO. So, so those are definitely uh, very important points. The uh, the unfavorable age dependency ratio, again, you know, the demographics and the age dependency ratio. So that is also a contributor to China's remarkable economic growth for 40 years. They had a very favorable age dependency ratio, but I think starting 2015, that, that ratio has become unfavorable, okay? And uh, what impact it, is, it, is that going to have on future economic growth is, is again uh, a, a question, but generally speaking, uh, definitely negative, right? Um, uh, uh, about two or three years ago, there was a report by McKinsey that 25% of uh, the orders for industrial robots are coming from China. Okay, so I think China is cognizant of the labor shortages that it's going to face. And that is again, you know, in some ways accelerating the investment in, in automation. Um, Absence of institutions, yes, definitely earlier debate was allowed. Uh, and now, uh, you know, the, 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 the regime has become much less tolerant of debate. There's no question about that. Um, so I think those are, those are very well taken. And then of course, uh, Amita's points about um, uh, technology. So now when it comes to technology, that's very interesting because uh, uh, you know, I would say right from, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago, China decided to uh, promote its own national champions, national technology champions. And um, uh, so uh, giving rise to Baidu, you know, um, Tencent, Alibaba, etc. Uh, and, the, and the virtual absence of the Western technology giants uh, in the Chinese market, right? When I first arrived in China, Google was operating uh, and, and their servers were located in Hong Kong and it was serving the Chinese market. But then China um, uh, promulgated a, a, a regulation that all servers had to be located within, uh, the, within mainland China, within the Chinese firewall. And then uh, Google decided not to comply with that. Um, and so uh, Google is not present, virtually not present in China. Facebook is not present in China. Amazon, I think, Amazon and eBay, perhaps due to their own uh, failures, they have not been able to sustain themselves in China. But uh, uh, the technology policy was um, uh, somewhat inward looking even, even uh, from the very beginning. And I know that um, there are universities in China, I think defense that are, defense related universities that were trying to even come up with an operating system uh, to rival that of uh, Microsoft, um, Microsoft Windows. Uh, how much progress China has made uh, in, in these areas remains to be seen, okay? But definitely foreign technology companies have found it very, very difficult to operate in China. Um, the lack of development of financial markets. I think here, the difference between India and China is very stark. I think India has you know, considering its level of development, it has remarkably sophisticated financial markets. And I would say, generally speaking, the level of corporate governance in India is very high. Uh, my colleague, uh, Liang Nang, he interviewed uh, 
uh, all the major leaders of the Chinese um, of the Chinese corporations, uh, with respect, with the exception of uh, Ranjan Fei of, of Huawei, he interviewed everybody else. Okay, and um, they were very uh, uh, open in saying that they see the board's role uh, more uh, as a support to the executive management rather than as a monitor of uh, the activities of the executive management, okay? So uh, corporate governance in India is, it, in China definitely has a, a longer way to go. And the lack of uh, an independent media has played a, a, a very uh, important role in the low level of transparency in the Chinese financial markets is very, very important for the financial markets to function efficiently. So I would say, uh, coming to what uh, I think Nilanjan made that point, when I, when I arrived in China in 2007, uh, the Chinese uh, stock markets were at an all time high, close to 6,000. You know, the Shanghai uh, Stock Exchange Index was about 6,000. And currently it is still trading about 40% lower at three and a half thousand, right? Whereas, you know, stock markets in the US and India have def, you know, gone way past their uh, pre-2008 uh, crisis peak. Um, and, uh, you know, they have recovered remarkably well. But the Chinese, I think the Chinese retail investors have definitely lost confidence in the, in the Chinese financial markets and in the stock markets. And um, uh, the, the Chinese investors, the, the, the retail investors who saved so much money, their avenues for investing their savings have been very, very limited, okay? Uh, the bank deposits have given remarkably low uh, interest rates. And so the only, you know, safe uh, destination for their savings has been real estate. And uh, for this reason, I think, uh, the Chinese government could not allow the real estate sector to fail. But now, of course, the, the, the real estate sector is face, facing such major headwinds that uh, it, it's, a, it's an open question whether they will be able to even save the real estate sector, right? When that bubble bursts, uh, you know, the implications that it could have for, uh, for the Chinese economy could actually be quite significant. Um, and, you know, they might lead to, uh, you know, several decades of... Uh, lost decades as it happened with the Japanese economy uh, after the real estate bubble burst in the late, late 80s. Um, uh, very, very important point, uh, Amita, about between the primary and, and tertiary education. I think uh, one, of, one of the, if you say one of the, I think uh, Nehru was a visionary in, in, in emphasizing tertiary education and research, you know, ISRO, and, and all these, you know, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, IITs, IIMs. Um, but definitely, uh, there is no question that India post-independence neglected primary education. And I think that uh, we, have, we have paid a price for that, but we have been, to be, to be uh, honest, we have been making steady progress in our literacy rates. Um, the role that institutions and governments are play, playing, the question that you asked. So political scientists, you know, talk about two concepts. You know, they talk about uh, state autonomy and state capacity, right? Uh, so uh, autonomy from what, right? It's autonomy from vested interests, okay? So the Chinese state has actually shown a remarkable uh, degree of autonomy from vested interests. Um, and it, it has shown tremendous capacity in implementing the policies that it has formulated, okay? Uh, so these, these two aspects have been major contributors for, for China's economic growth also, right? And if anything, uh, post-2020, uh, when uh, Xi Jinping has uh, initiated this crackdown on the private sector, uh, you could actually argue that the autonomy of the state has actually increased significantly, right? In fact, to the point of distancing itself from the, from the very sectors that gave the Chinese economy so much uh, growth um, and, and so many resources over, over, over so many decades, right? So I think uh, 
uh, that is that is the other thing. Marginal return uh, of, of incremental investment. I think, uh, generally speaking, of course, I think your 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 point is well taken. That um, uh, as the infrastructure keeps improving in a country, uh, the the marginal return on the on additional investments uh, goes down. Um, but I think one of the criticisms against China has been that there have been some downright bad investments, right, and, and uh, questionable investments. So it, was it necessary to roll out high-speed network to all parts of the country? Uh, and uh, how is the Chinese railway system going to deal with uh, 850 billion in uh, debt? Uh, my colleagues, you know, always used to point out, for example, there's the maglev train that goes from uh, Shanghai airport to it doesn't go to the center of the city, it goes just to Pudong, you know, it's a, which is like Navi Mumbai, right? It, it, so the airport is in Navi Mumbai and the or Pudong and the and the train stops in, in Pudong. It's a 38 kilometer stretch. And um, my my Chinese colleagues, you know, always used to point, point out to me that uh, this investment doesn't even recover the interest payments that the that uh, you know that that the investment has required right for the the, for the the capital that was that was borrowed let alone the operating expenses so there are many such white ele elephants in china and this is of course you know um, uh, the point that uh, uh, huang yasheng at mit also makes frequently that uh, um, the the top down economies are able to make progress much faster, but they also make more mistakes, right? Because uh, there's not that deliberation process that uh, democracies necessarily have to, go, have to go through before those investments are made. So these are just some, some, some comments. I really want to thank uh, uh, the discussants and uh, the moderator for, for very, very valuable feedback, which have helped me to refine this presentation. Uh, Professor Velamudi, we have few questions. So in the paucity of time, let me uh, take one of them, which is uh, asked by Professor Bama Deb uh, Sidgel. So his question is, uh, Professor S. Ramakrishnan paper is very comprehensive and scholarly. How South Asia should extend its relation with China in the next decade? What policies are pertinent for South Asian countries from China to move ahead? So I think this is something that uh, uh, somebody who is uh, an expert on uh, geopolitical uh, studies uh, or, uh, you know, um, what are these called? Security uh, studies mm -hmm. uh, will be better able to answer. Um, as far as I was, uh, I'm concerned during my time in China, um, with the help of uh, the China Europe International Business School, which fully supported me, uh, and Tata Sun's China office, we organized, I think, six China-India cooperation forums, uh, because I firmly believe that the two countries uh, can um, um, gain much more uh, from cooperating with each other than you know, following uh, the path of conflict. Um, but uh, the Doklam crisis in 2017 and the Galwan crisis in 2020 have been very, very uh, disappointing, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, especially the Galwan, uh, Galwan crisis of 2020 uh, has set us back significantly. Uh, we have made a lot of progress, but it has set us back significantly. And it's going to take a lot of effort on both sides to rebuild the trust. Um, and I believe that it, uh, it takes two to tango. Uh, and I think uh, both countries need to, to put in more effort uh, to uh, accommodate the other's interests. I've actually published articles in the Chinese media where I've said that one of the biggest sticking points for India is uh, the lack of access for Indian pharmaceutical companies to the Chinese market. Uh, when we know for a fact that uh, the Chinese consumers are craving for uh, more affordable Indian generic drugs, right? right. And so uh, while um, uh, you know, many uh, specialists in trade have, uh, have criticized India not joining the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, 
I have actually been supportive of the of the government. I think it was the right move on on India's part because I don't see what would have changed if India had joined the RCEP, right? Because there are clearly non non tariff barriers that are preventing the Indian pharmaceutical companies from succeeding in China. Uh, the response of the Chinese has always been that these barriers are not specific to India, and that's true. Okay, but it hurts India the most because India has uh, India is the biggest producer of generics in the world, and uh, by not having access to to the Chinese market, I think uh, India is is really um, uh, not being treat, treated fairly in this partnership, right? And of course, then we can talk about IT services also, but. Uh, I've always said that the acid test uh, for for uh, openness on the on the Chinese side to to, to interact with India uh, on a more cooperative basis would be uh, what happens to the access for Indian pharmaceutical companies, right? So that's uh, that that hasn't happened. So I'm actually not that optimistic based on what we are uh, reading uh, in, in in the media and everything. Um, but uh, let's hope that there is a breakthrough. Uh, and if there's a breakthrough, I think uh, the both, both sides will have to undo the damage that has been done since uh, June of May, June of uh, 2020, um, in order to get back to, to, to the situation that we were before that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's well known that we are kind of still dependent on China. If you look yes. into the trade balance, in fact, trade balance has increase post Gulf one, you know, so that's to say your point. Now, there is another very interesting question uh, from Roy Chazen. And what he asked is, it seems that the West is thirsty for a democratic power to take the lead to counterbalance China in Asia, both economically and politically. But seems like India is not taking the opportunity. Is this so? And do you think it can take more initiative of a lead? <laughs> so. I'm not a geopolitical expert. Uh, I think maybe Priyanka can answer this question uh, better. Um, but uh, I think uh, India is right to be careful. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, what is it, a three and a half thousand kilometer border with China. And um, we, you know, relying on a country that is 7,000 or 8,000 kilometers away to support us. Um, when in the past, mm -hmm. you know, that country has not been consistent in its support for, uh, for its allies um, is something that I think is front and center on Indian policymakers' mind. Uh, so I think the better option for India would be to mend its ties with China uh, rather than adopt... Uh, a confrontational approach uh, based on uh, support that could simply disappear right at some point yeah yeah so uh, priyanka do you want to touch base on this or yeah uh, uh, firstly i would uh, okay about the question uh, i don't think west is thirsty for a democratic power in a sense that they are more looking for coalitions uh, in, in Asia, right? We have the Indo-Pacific strategy, we have the Quad power. Of course, India is expected to take a role, but uh, it should be commensurate with its capabilities. Capabilities, manufacturing capabilities, cap military capabilities. To say that it will be in a position to take on China uh, it will be uh, far-fetched from the reality. Uh, as clearly uh, Professor Batra, Professor Velamuri, and Professor Banik indicated that we are very much dependent on China, uh, on the manufactured goods, the cheap manufactured goods that flow. Of course, there's a restriction on the investments now, the trade balance uh, or the trade deficit is growing, uh, which clearly shows that the amount of trade dependence that we have still on China. Uh, so, what we need to first focus on in order to deal with China geopolitically is to uh, have our house in order, which is to build our manufacturing capabilities, uh, to, to uh, be uh, self-sufficient technologically. And uh, to become self-sufficient technologically, I think uh, we need to uh, uh, diversify our dependence, uh, not only uh, increase our dependence on China, we, should, we cannot increase our dependence on China, but diversify, as well as uh, 
emphasize more on our on developing our manufacturing sector so uh, about West going for that binary approach, I think it's more on, on the lines of coalition and not uh, pinning all hopes on India because uh, capabilities has to be, uh, sorry, uh, ambitions has to be, uh, you know, in sync with the capabilities. And India, of course, finds itself in a very complex position caught between its uh, regional role and global responsibilities. So uh, from that point, it's, it, it'll be a difficult walk for the Indian leadership. Thank you, Priyanka. I think we have gone past our uh, allotted time, but uh, it's a fantastic discussion we have had so far. And uh, thank you, Professor Velamuri, for this nice presentation, informative presentation. There are many new points uh, which I'm personally taking with me, which I was not knowing before. And I'm sure some of the audience uh, will agree, or most of the audience will agree with me on that. Uh, thank you, Professor Amita. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, now, let me hand it over to Dr. Simi Mehta to give the vote of thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Nilanjan Banik. It, I totally agree with you when you say that we have learned so much. And certainly, it has been a very, very uh, great uh, and insightful um, in-depth uh, uh, deliberation that has gone through in this um, webinar. So I would like to formally uh, thank uh, all of you on behalf of the IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics uh, to our um, uh, respected speaker, Professor Ram, S. Ramkrishna Velamuri, uh, for sparing your time time and for such a detailed explanation and also taking um, uh, questions and uh, the discussions remarks. Uh, um, and I would also like to thank our uh, renowned uh, discussants, my teacher, Professor Amita Batra. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, remarks and for uh, critiquing um, uh, Professor Velamuri's uh, uh, presentation and also throwing important uh, insights um, to all of us. Uh, Dr. Priyanka Pandit, thank you so much for uh, your uh, uh, remarks. Uh, we are really grateful. Um, I would also like to thank the moderator of the session, Professor Nilanjan Banik, for your um, important interventions and also for uh, moderating the session so wonderfully well. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank all our attendees here on uh, Zoom and also those who are watching us live on Facebook. Thank you for your questions and for your proactive participation. I would also like to thank all those who would be watching us later on our YouTube channel and listening to the program on our different podcasts. So thank you so much. I would uh, wish you all a very, very good day and please stay safe. Thank you. We look forward to learning more from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.